Good Wednesday night to everyone. Um, I am, according to my habit, I'm a couple of minutes early because I wanted to have a chance just to um, give everyone the opportunity to find the live feed and to, to join us. So just want to say happy, happy Wednesday to you guys and hope that you enjoyed this gorgeous day as much as I did. I, I got up early this morning as is my habit and I have a patio and that patio has, especially during clement weather, has become my sanctuary. And so I'll, I love to get up before the sun comes up and I have some lights that I turn on, some, um, I guess you would call them retro bulb lights. And then, you know, of course, I put on my mosquito centronella candle and I'm out there with uh, my Bible, my notebook, and of course, my, my two dogs always want to be out there with me. And that's where I meet with God. And in the summertime, that is just the best. And another thing, of course, I love the hot weather. That's, I know some of you find that completely insane, but I love the hot weather. Um, and the predictability every day, you know what the weather's going to be hot and sunny. Um, so I, I love, I love my time on my patio for sing in the morning and then maybe later at night. And I love the heat and the sunshine. I love the food of summer, uh, all the delicious things off the grill and then fresh vegetables. I think I have eaten coleslaw just about every day of the week for the last two weeks. So there's so many things about summer that I love and that I am grateful for. And tonight, while it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the season, tonight I'm grateful for the opportunity to spend the next few minutes with you talking about the Word of God. A few weeks ago, as a matter of fact, this is our third session on expressions of faith. So we started a series and it'll go through the month of July on the seven expressions of faith as found in the New Testament. What inspired this study, I had gone through a series by uh, Pastor Des Evans from the Des Evans Library um, on the book of Jude. And in that series, Pastor Des uh, just briefly mentioned that there were seven expressions of faith in the New Testament. And he said that the seven expressions of New Testament um, faith or the seven expressions of faith in the New Testament, that there were seven of them. And then in true Des form and fashion, he proceeded to give you three of them. And the other four remained unknown. And I, I've listened through several other tapes from the Des Evans Library that I thought might contain those seven expressions, but of course I, I have not found them. I'm not saying they're not there, but there are literally thousands of those tapes and I obviously have not listened to all of them. So I, being a curious creature, I decided that I was going to go through the New Testament myself and see if I could dig out all the expressions of faith as found in the New Testament. And what I found, I, I certainly found seven, and actually to date I have found nine. So, um, one of, a couple of things are happening right now. Pastor Des is sitting in the great cloud of witnesses um, in heaven right now, laughing at the ones I came up with, or he's giving me a thumbs up saying, that's it girl, you got it. So, whichever one it is, we're going with it. So I'm going to take the three that Pastor Des uh, gave from the book of, um, that gave during his teaching on the book of Jude, and then I'm going to add four, maybe five others uh, that I've been able to ferret out from the New Testament. So the first uh, Wednesday that we talked about faith, we actually did a biblical study of faith and the words that are used in the Old Testament and New Testament to express faith. And we did our entire night on the word Amen. In Hebrew, it would be Amen or Amen. And um, looked at the power and just the etymology of that word and then some rabbinic understanding and perception and teaching behind that word. Last week, we talked about saving faith, the kind of faith that allows us to take that step from the kingdom of darkness 
into the kingdom of his marvelous light. And it's so good to see Leon and Curtis and Kelly um, and Kay, and I think I've seen several others on here. It's good to have all of you on here tonight. Thank you so much for, for sharing this time with me. So tonight, we've, gone, we've looked at faith in a general context, general biblical context. We've looked at saving faith, the faith that allows us to step out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light. And tonight, we're going to explore the expression of holy faith. And you will find holy faith written just as that in the book of Jude, verse 20. No chapter because Jude only has 25 verses. And you'll find holy faith mentioned in verse 20. Um, before we start talking about holy faith, the word holy in the Old Testament comes from the root kadosh. And in the New Testament from the Greek word agias. And when you find the word holy it's usually attached to something else. And I just kind of did a list of things that, that are holy um, from New Testament to Old Testament. There is the holy mountain, and we know that the holy mountain is Jerusalem. There is the holy name, and we know that the holiest name of all is the name of Jesus. But if you see holy name in the Old Testament, it's going to be referring to the covenant name of God, which is Yahweh. Then there is, of course, the Holy One of Israel. This is Isaiah's favorite title or name for God. He is the Holy One of Israel. Then there is the Holy Spirit. This is probably the most frequent uh, combination of holy and another word that we find throughout all of Scripture is Holy Spirit. And sometimes you'll find Holy Ghost. And the use of Holy Ghost is more of an old King James expression. Um, so in your NIV, your NASV, uh, your New King James is going to be Holy Spirit. Then there are the Holy Angels. There are the Holy Prophets. There's the Holy Covenant. There's the Holy Child. And of course, we know the Holy Child is Jesus. There's Holy Ground. And you'll remember that from Exodus chapter 3. Moses, Moses, take off your shoes. For the ground upon which you are standing is Holy Ground. There are the Holy Scriptures. There is the Holy Kiss, which is a form of greeting that was used by New Testament believers. Um, nothing sexual, nothing romantic, just a, a greeting between fellow believers. Then there's holy brethren, and that's me and you. Can you believe it? We are called the holy brethren, and that kind of just takes me back a little bit because I had to, I have to ask myself, when I'm around my Christian brothers and sisters, do I treat them as holy brethren, um, or do I treat them as common? And then there are holy hands, because when we worship the Lord, we are to lift up holy hands to the Lord. Then there's a holy calling, the call of God on your life, on my life. It is not common. There's nothing ordinary nor mundane about it. The calling of God upon our lives is a holy calling because it comes from the Lord. And then there's the holy priesthood. There is holy conversation. There are holy men and women. And then the heart of our context tonight, which is holy faith. And so let me, let me just go and read this for us in the book of Jude. I'm going to start with verse 17, even though the passage is found in verse 20. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you in the last time, there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. These are the ones who cause divisions, they're worldly minded, devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Building yourselves up on your most holy faith and then praying in the Spirit. If you were to read the book of Jude, all 25 verses of it, 
And by the way, I just spent like four, well, January through May, I just spent five months teaching weekly from the book of Jude. And for those of you who were able to join us for a portion of that, because I took it from a live uh, classroom setting to an online format in the middle of March when the pandemic hit and the stay in shelter um, became a part of our everyday life. So the book of Jude is still very much alive to me. The book of Jude, the first 16 verses, Jude is dealing with the kinds of people that can often worm their way into the body of Christ. Those individuals that can, can come in unawares. And so he's dealing with these folks and he's describing them and what kind of activity they're involved in and what kind of um, characteristics they're going to be manifesting if they are to be found in your midst. And then in verse 17, he completely shifts the attention. He says from verses 1 through 16, these are those guys, but you, beloved, you, beloved. It's interesting to me that in the New Testament, Paul especially, and I see it here with Jude, will definitely say that every human being is loved by God. Every human being. No, from the vilest sinner to the most godly saint. Every human being is loved by God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But only those who have entered into a relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ are called beloved. You see this prolifically in the writing of Paul, and now we see it here in the book of Jude. He's saying, but you beloved. And so now he is specifically, when he says, but you beloved, he is addressing those men and women who are followers of Jesus Christ. Not just casual, I'm thinking about this Jesus thing, but these are committed followers, men and women who have committed their lives to following and pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, but you beloved, ought to remember the words which were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last time there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. Again, he gives a very general synopsis of what these folks are like and what they're doing. And then in verse 20, he repeats himself, but you beloved for the second time, but you beloved, don't be like those folks. This is what you ought to do. Building yourselves up on your most holy faith. What I want to talk about first is this building yourselves up. Do you notice that there is a human element involved here? He doesn't say God's going to build you up. He doesn't say you're going to accidentally or vicariously build, be built up. He says you build yourselves up. This is the human element. You build yourselves up. Now, there's a divine factor always involved. God is at work in and through everything around us. But there are some things that God, he will enable us, empower us, give us the desire to do, to, to go after, to follow. But then he requires us to build ourselves up. See, God is not some sort of cosmic bellhop or um, cosmic Santa Claus. There's some things that we just have to do for ourselves. Not because God is mean, not because... Um, God doesn't want us to be successful. There are some things that we have to do for ourselves because there's some strengths that we just will not gain, some lessons that we will not learn if we do not become active participators with God in our own spiritual growth and life. Building is a popular expression throughout Scripture. Let's just look at some things that people built. Noah built an ark. God told him to build a boat and probably right after Noah said, and by the way, what is a boat? Noah built an ark according to the word of the Lord. Abram built altars or Abraham, he built altars. Anytime he met with God, anytime he made um, a commitment to God, entered into a higher level of relationship with God, 
he built an altar. Then you have Moses. Moses built the tabernacle. Now Moses didn't go out with his own hands and build the tabernacle, but no, Moses brought the instructions for the tabernacle and the encouragement and he oversaw and appointed the various people who would build and put the tabernacle together. David built a kingdom. There's one for you. Solomon built a temple. Nehemiah built a wall. Now I want to camp for just a moment at the wall that Nehemiah built. Nehemiah built a wall around Jerusalem. This wall was for protection. It was a boundary to keep people that were inside safe and to keep people who were on the outside who might do harm from getting in. But here's how the wall was built. The wall was built by people building their homes and they would build their homes and connect their homes to each other. And so the back side of their house actually became the wall. So by building their home, they built the wall. Let that get deep inside your heart and spirit. I wonder if we have neglected building our homes and I'm not talking about bricks and mortar, wood and nails. I'm talking about building the relationship within our own family. Have you built your home? And by the way, the building of the home is not just the job of mom. Dad has responsibility building that home as well. And it's not just mom. It's not just dad. The children have responsibility to build that home as well. How do we build our home? Not again, talking about a physical building. We build our home by generating, creating a safe place where the, the ways of the Lord are taught. We build our home by passing on our values, by, by passing on our faith to the next generation. You see, we, we have a fantastic youth pastor at Bethesda Community Church. I don't know of anyone who loves and spends more time reasoning with young people than Pastor Shaler Smith. He is an awesome children's, uh, children, a youth pastor. Pastor Brenda Hardiman, you cannot find a better children's pastor on this planet. She is, she is par excellent. Both of them stunningly amazing in all that they do. But if all your children and all your young people get is what the children's pastor or the youth minister give to them, it's not enough. You build and you impart values, convictions to your children. And, and moms and dads, that's how you build your home. Will your children remember hearing you pray for them? Will your children remember seeing mom and dad kneeling by the bed or in front of the couch, starting their day praying? This, this is important because we're trying to build a church without building a home and it doesn't work like that. We build our home. The church is only as strong as the home. And I know that some of you are single parents and I know that you are doing your best. You know what? God gives you the grace to build your home solo if you have to. And young people, maybe your mom and dad aren't followers of Jesus, then you build your home by praying for your parents and praying for your family and speaking the word of God and speaking truth to your family. You build your home by imparting your, your convictions, your faith, and the truth of God's word into that place you call home. And when we do that, when we build home and then we gather together as a church, it is a powerful explosive event because you build the home and you build the church. So enough said about that. Um, I could probably spend quite a bit of time there, but we build our home. Proverbs 24, 27 says that we are to build our homes. And, and I think it's time for us to ask the Lord to give us creative uh, ways to build up those who are in our home. It's just my husband and I, 
and, and that is our home. That's us. And we challenge each other. We build each other up. When my husband is frustrated and he doesn't think he can do something, then I build him up by saying, babe, let's just take a minute and let's just offer this situation to the Lord. Let's just give this to the Lord for a moment. And when I'm overwhelmed and I'm having a not good day and I'm wanting to, to throw things, my husband will put his arm around me and say, babe, let's just take this to the Lord. And that's how we build each other up. Not with false platitudes or anything like that, but with the truth of God's word and by praying for each other. Parents, let me challenge you with this. The next time your young person is distraught or upset, instead of trying to fix them, instead of trying to fix their problem, take them to the Lord. Say, let's pray. Let's stop everything we're doing right now and let's pray about this. That's how you build your home. Um, we're also told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, that we are to build each other up. Now, we can, we can use the word encourage, but it's the same thing that we are to build each other up. Now, we don't build each other up with false hopes or delusional things. I mean, no one needs to come to me and build me up with things like, wow, you could be a ballet dancer. You could be you could be an Olympian figure skater. That's ridiculous. God hasn't said anything to me about those things. And you know, no, I can't. If God supernaturally empowers me, sure, but I have no desire to do that. But if someone calls me up and says, hey, just wanted to let you know, the, the online teachings, the Bible studies, those things have really encouraged me. That's building me up with honesty. And I see that, that Frida, Frida Chadwick is on here. Frida Chadwick is one of the most amazing people I know. And if I were to go to Frida and say to her, hey, Frida, I just want to encourage you. I think that you are going to get a job as a cruise director and you're going to make you know, $500,000 a year and you and Mr. Chadwick are going to get to travel the world. She would probably really like that, but that wouldn't be honest. You don't build each other up with delusions. You build each other up with the truth. I could truthfully call Mrs. Chadwick and say to her, you are a mighty woman of God and you have helped to shape the minds and the spirits of an entire generation through Bethesda Christian School. That would be the truth and that would be honest building up. So we build each other up according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. And I know that sometimes we're a little hesitant to build people up because we might think something like, ah, Pastor Dan, people tell him they love his sermons all the time. People tell him, you know, that, that God's ministered to them and changed their lives through his message and through his pastoral ministry. And, ah, oh, he just doesn't need to hear that from me. He just, he doesn't need any more encouragement. Seriously, I have never in my 40 years of full-time ministry, I have never heard anyone come to me and say to me, ah, oh, I just wish people would quit encouraging me. I've been so encouraged this week. I can't take not one more word of encouragement. I have never heard that. And I seriously don't think I ever will. But what I do hear is I am so discouraged. I just need a word of building up. I just need a word of encouragement. And guys, it's a phone call. It's a text message. It's an email. That, that's all to give that person a word of encouragement and it can make all the difference in the world. So we are to build our homes. We are to build each other up. We know in Matthew, Jesus says um, from the confession of Peter, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says upon this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus builds his church. And the church is built when men and women are convicted of their sin and they repent and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and they are born again into the body of Christ. That's how the church is built. But then, hey, you know, we build the local church too because we get to help. We don't build the church as in we can't save people, but we build the church in that we are a part of the church and we participate in the church. If I had my, I need to get me an opinion flag because, 
what can I use here? I've got a flashlight. I'll wave my flashlight. This is this is my indication of I'm about to give a Marty opinion. I'm about to give a Marty opinion, but I believe this is a pen, this opinion can be sought out and built in scripture. Thank God for social media. Thank God for online streaming, YouTube, Facebook, Zoom, all the other electronic mediums that have allowed us to continue with church when we were not allowed together in groups. But here is some true truth for you. As awesome and wonderful as those electronic venues are, they have served their purpose. They are serving their purpose. They cannot, they do not, and they will not ever replace the physical gathering of the body of Christ. Now, I understand it's too soon for some people to regather. There are some people that are physically compromised and they, they just, they're, they're too overwhelmed with all the possibilities of what could happen. Thank God you're allowed to watch online. Some people watch church online because physically they cannot get to church. They're either ill or they're separated by too much distance. There, there are a lot of extenuating circumstances, but I also know that there are people who are going to stay home and watch church online because they don't want to get out of their PJs. And folks, we're going to have to get over ourselves because there's something, there's a dynamic in the gathering of the church, in the physical gathering of the church that just cannot be replaced by an electronic venue. So, okay, Marty Rant over. So I hope you all still love me after saying that. And again, I am for video streaming. I mean, I'm on a video format right now, so I can't be that against it. My concern is that we are going to get lazy and um, negligent in the physical gathering together of the body, and we need that. I was in a conference more than 20 years ago, and there was a lady that was sitting next to me in this conference, and she turned to me in the conference, and the Lord used her to minister to me, body to body. She ministered to me. If all I had gotten that night was the sermon, I would have missed the greatest impartation of my life. It was that woman who was willing, who was sitting right next to me, and she was willing to turn and look at me and, and put her hand on my shoulder and pray for me, and God did something profound in my life. That's body ministry. And, you know, you can't lay hands on somebody and pray for them through a camera. And there's just, there's an impartation that takes place in the live physical format that just can't quite be achieved in the electronic format. So, okay, I said rant was over. I'm sorry. I totally kept ranting, didn't I? Okay, so we are the church, and Jesus builds his church, but we also participate in the building of the church when we come together and we do the ministry of the church because different gifts have been given to different people. Some people are eyes, some people are mouths, some people are ears, some people are hands, some people are feet, but we make a total body when we come together and and we we have the, the gathering together of the people, the physical gathering of the people. So let me move on with this before I dig myself any deeper. So our task as the church, as being built up, our task is to penetrate the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We build ourselves up through this community, corporate expression of life. When we talk about church, we have to understand that there is the universal church. The universal church would be every man, every woman, every child who has from the resurrection of Christ to present day accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is the universal church, past, present, and future. Then we have the local church. Bethesda Community Church is my local church. And I know um, my friend Ann is, is at a church in Illinois. And I know that some of you go to different churches around the Metroplex. I know that some of you go to church at Antioch or a variety of churches in Huntsville, Alabama. So 
that is the local church, and we get to help build up our local church. I, I just have to say this. There's a phrase called parachurch, and we throw that term around, and we designate any ministry, um, any Christian ministry that's not attached to a church, and we call it a parachurch. Parachurch, to me, is a nonsensical word. You are either the church or you are not. It should not be parachurch. It should be paradenominational. It is a it is a ministry group that is outside of a denomination or a fellowship, but you are either the church or you are not the church. There's nothing in between. The church builds itself up. We build each other up. We build ourselves up, and here comes our faith word. We build ourselves up in the most holy faith. The faith that's being used here could be a creed or a code of ethics, the dogma or the systematic belief system of a collected group of people. But Jude is speaking about more than just a belief system, the faith of a particular group. He's speaking about a behavior system. Abraham grew in his faith. The first thing that God asked of him was not Genesis chapter 22, take up your son, your only son, Isaac. That happened at the end of Abraham's journey, not the beginning, because Abraham had to grow in his faith. At the beginning of his journey, God said, leave this people and go to a place that I will show you. And then there were many, according to rabbinic traditions, there were 10 tests of Abraham's faith and his leaving his country and his people, his tribe, was the first test. And then the offering up of Isaac being the 10th and the final test. Abraham grew in his faith, which makes sense. We go from faith to faith. I don't, our faith is not um, a level faith. It's not a horizontal faith. It is a faith that should be ever increasing, um, a faith that is ever moving upward and growing and becoming greater and um, a little closer to Jesus than before. But Jude's referring not just to a code of ethics or a system of dogma, but a behavior system. Uh, a behavior system that allows you to grow in your faith, to grow and mature. The first principle of faith is always discipline, not dogma or doctrine. Um, the most tragic thing in our lives is when we start something and we don't finish it. Faith is not something that we start like a project, like building a model car or doing one of those elaborate paint by number sets and we get all the greens in and then we get bored with it and move away or we start a jigsaw puzzle and we get the we get the edges done but we don't fill in the center. It is tragic that so many Christians start their faith but do not finish their faith. They start by believing in Jesus, but then they never grow beyond that saving faith. This holy faith is a faith that allows us to grow and to mature. This holy faith is a faith that allows us to become more and more like Jesus. This holy faith allows us to move to the gift of faith and the fruit of faith. This is our holy faith. But you, brethren, verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. You know, we build ourselves up in all kinds of things. Um, I know that I'm at the age to where Stuart and I are talking about building up our retirement or building up um, the safety of, of our home or building up our vacation time. We build up all kinds of things. Uh, some people build up their ego. Some people build up their anger. Some people build up their sense of rights and privileges. We're all building up something. But are you building up the right thing? I talked at the beginning tonight about the need to build up our home. And the best way to build, the, build up the church is to build up the home and start there first. But we build up our most holy faith. I think that 
this might be a good moment for us to take a look at what it is that we're building up. Are we building up an empire or are we building up our faith? Are we building up a system or are we building up our faith? Are we building up our argument or are we building up our faith? To build up your faith has a persevering element or ring to it. You don't build something up by giving up the first time it becomes uncomfortable or inconvenient. I, I used to be um, a long distance biker. I still left a bike and I am determined to eventually get my bike back out and start biking again. But I remember the first time I started biking and I was doing some uphill um, sprints, I thought I was gonna die. Every muscle in my body hurt. I got not even a fourth of the way up the incline and I had to get off my bike and walk it to the top. So embarrassing. But you know, I had to make a decision. I was gonna either keep going and build myself up or I was gonna stop. And I made the decision to keep going and build myself up. It's the same way with faith. When you start building up your faith, it will seem too big, too insurmountable, too impossible, but you just keep at it. Because he, let me let you in on this huge secret. When you start building up your most holy faith, guess who's right there to help you? Guess who's right there to cheer you on and give you strength that you didn't know you had? Guess who's right there to, to give you the right word at the right moment to motivate you to keep going? That's right. The Lord himself is right there as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith. So how do you build yourself up in your most holy faith? I have for years heard this passage connected so tightly with verse 21 that you build yourselves up by praying in the Holy Spirit. That is definitely one way to do it. You guys know if any of you are watching and you are not Pentecostal charismatic, then you know, let me let me pull the blinders off. I am very Pentecostal charismatic. I believe in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that certainly does include praying in the Spirit or praying in a language that I've never learned before. So I certainly build myself up by praying in the Spirit. I think it's important. As many of you as are open and willing to exercise that gift, it is important for you to exercise that gift and to pray in the Spirit. It does build us up. That is one way to build ourselves up in our faith is by praying in the Spirit, but it is not the only way. We build ourselves, we build up our most holy faith by spending time in the Word of God. Acts 20 verse 32 tells us that the word builds us up. That as we read the word, not just, not just run through it like a marathon, but as we study the word of God, it builds us up. I ran into the most fantastic, almost by accident, the most fantastic way of doing Bible study. And honestly, my heart is grieved that I only discovered this four years ago and started implementing it into my life. Because the truth is, I may not live long enough to go through the entire Bible through using this method of Bible study, but here's what I do. Every year, I pray and ask the Lord to direct me. I choose two books from the Bible, typically one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. And I read those two books for the entire year. Um, not just read, I study. I, I actually happen to have my journal here. This is my journal just from, from this year. And I, I take notes and just write, you know, do like, I call it my commentary. And I write commentary on it. And I do this for every, for every book that I study. It has changed my life because the discipline factor itself of actually disciplining myself to do that and then having to get that closely connected with the Word of God. I, I, I must have, the book of Hebrews is one of the two books that I'm reading this year. And 
and going through the book of Hebrews, and I'm going carefully through the book of Hebrews. I've gone through it three times, and right now I'm back in Ezekiel, and I'll get back in Hebrews here in a little bit for the fourth time. I had no idea as many times in the past as I've read through like a like a race car driver, read through the book of Hebrews, I had no idea how many times the writer of Hebrews said, let us draw near, and the implications of the repetition of those phrases. The, the revelation, the building up of my faith that has taken place. So according to Acts chapter 20, verse 32, the word builds up our faith. So when you get into the Word of God, you read the Word, you study the Word. You don't have to have a PhD to do this. You don't have to go to seminary. Just open your Bible and read and study and look look for patterns. And I don't want to teach how to study the Bible tonight because that's not what this lesson is about. But what I, what I do want to say is that we build up our faith by reading the Word. The Word is, is central and important to the building up of our faith. Um, so praying in the Spirit, spending time in the Word, reading, studying the Word. And Ann Chatfield, we need to talk because Ezekiel's one of my books this year, and Ezekiel's just kind of wrecking me in a number of ways. Um, another thing that we do to build up our faith is we hear the Word, the preaching of the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so we hear the Word of God, and as we hear the Word of God, it builds up our faith. It stirs up within us the possibilities of what God just might do, what God can do, what God has done in the past. Guys, testimonies build up our faith. Testimonies are are huge. It's that they're a huge part of our faith. When I hear someone talk about what God has done in their life, sat with a woman today in a BSM interview, and she was sharing about how God has brought her from a place of complete destitution to a place of saying, yes, Lord, I believe that your call is upon my life for ministry and the transformation that has taken place in her life. That testimony builds my faith. That remember the song, what he's done for others, he will do for you. That God wants you to have your faith built up. Not foolishness. I'm not talking about bigger houses, nicer cars. I'm talking about the faith that will just allow me to walk through this life with joy unspeakable, full of glory. A faith that will allow me to do life with my eyes on Jesus and my feet walking straight and not wobbling and falling every other step. That is more important to me than houses and cars and bank accounts. Because at the end of the day, all those things are going to burn up. But who I am for Jesus and the way I walk with him in time will have eternal importance. And if I want faith for anything, I want my faith to be built up to be an absolute sold out Jesus follower. But you, beloved, building up your faith. This is your responsibility. This is my responsibility. Pray in the Spirit. Study the Word of God. Hear the preached Word of God. Listen to testimonies and let the testimonies of the redeemed resonate within your heart and your imagination. What He's done for others, He can do for you. David did not just step out onto the battlefield one day and take down Goliath. He said, God has given me the bear. God has given me the lion. This giant will be no different. David's faith got built up because he was willing to deal with what was in front of him. The bear was in front of him to take his sheep. He dealt with it. The lion was in front of him to destroy his flock, and he dealt with it. The giant was before the armies of Israel bringing an assault against the name and the character of God, and David dealt with it. One step at a time, he takes us from faith to faith, building yourselves up in your most 
holy faith. Because you see, this kind of faith is holy. It's precious to God. First Peter is going to call it the precious faith. Because it's a faith that comes not because you've got money or talent or prestige or position. It's a faith that comes because you've been willing to walk it out. Holy faith is a faith that's been walked out or being walked out. Build up your most holy faith. We've talked about saving faith. That gets us into the kingdom. Holy faith keeps us in the kingdom. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord put within your heart a hunger to build up your most holy faith. And may you know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. May you know him and may we all become more like him. In Jesus' name, bless you all. Thank you for joining me tonight.